We're starting a new series. Come on. Unleashing Miracles. Super excited about this one. Super excited. Um, Has anyone in here lived a life where there's never been a flaw or an issue? Okay, yeah, no. None of us have. Yeah, close, right? So we all hit times where we need miracles in our lives. For me, it's probably probably almost an everyday occurrence. (laughs) I need a miracle in my finances. I need a miracle in my body. I need a miracle in a relationship. I need a miracle in a situation. Um, Whatever it might be, we need to understand what miracles are all about because God is a good God who wants to pour out more than we could ever imagine. But we need to learn how to unleash miracles into our lives. Amen. It's great that people come and you can come to church on Sunday and walk away with a miracle. And that's going to keep happening and it's going to keep happening more. But we're on a Wednesday when you hit a crisis. I don't want you having to run to church to get your miracle. I want you to know how to unleash a miracle then and there. Amen. Right? Amen. I want you to know how to unleash miracles every single day of your life so that you can be fully equipped. But... Our history. I grew up knowing God could do miracles, that he could heal, but I didn't know he would heal. Big difference. One is kind of like, well, it's kind of like the lottery ticket. If you happen to get the winning ticket, you get your miracle. But otherwise, I don't know. He grew up thinking and being taught that miracles didn't happen. They were a setup or a scam, yeah. Yeah, So we had these two different, and then all of that changed. And what changed that for us was we experienced miracles. (laughs) So when you have an experience, that is part of, uh, here's a rabbit trail. Part of the, the issue with this generation is they've been raised in theology and not having an experience, a personal experience with God. And then they're leaving the church, they're leaving God, because all they have is theology. We need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that changes us. Come on. And once you experience him, and once you experience a miracle, there's no going back. There's just no going back. So we want you guys to understand and start realizing what some of these are. So how were miracles (laughs) unleashed throughout the Bible? The Bible's full of principles and keys, and once you know the key... It can become your lifestyle and become easy and frequent in your life. Okay, so anyone remember these? It's, yeah, it's like that. Oh. Anybody can do one? Raise can your it, hand. Has anyone solved one of these things? Okay. Oh, oh yeah, oh. Well, we got one right here. See? Okay, two. In this whole auditorium, there's two. Maybe half of Winnipeg has, but I, this thing drove me crazy, right? Because you get so close. And like three sides are all right, and then you look at the other, and they're all messed up. It's like, what in the world? Well, my nephew could do this in under two minutes. And we would mess it all up, and he would do it again. And we're like, what the heck? I can't can't even, I've spent five years trying to do it once. Okay, anyone else with me? I took it apart and put it back together the right way. (laughs) You peel the little stickers off, you know, you need the ones with stickers. Either Um, that or spray paint, you know. (laughs) But I remember my nephew telling me, he said, once you understand the key or the trick, you'll be able to do it every time. So you see the same thing with miracles. So many of us are trying so hard to get miracles, and we're like, ah, I don't get it. Once you understand the key to unleashing miracles in your life, you'll be able to deal with it. No matter how jumbled up your life gets, you'll be able to get back. To the miracles, okay? So we want to look at the common denominator that happened when Jesus was doing miracles on the earth. And there's a great story. So we're going to share a bunch of stories, and you guys have to do the research. Okay? You guys are going to find the common denominator in these stories. Can you do that? All right. Okay. We'll make it as easy as possible, but the exam is on you guys, okay? No, it's an interesting thing. So there's this this master that comes who had a servant or they called him a slave and he was sick and he needed some help from Jesus so he comes to Jesus and he says can you help my servant because he's very ill to the point of death 
And Jesus says, absolutely. So we're going to pick it up in Luke 7, verses Verse 7, to, 7 10. to 10. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. This is the master. He's coming to Jesus. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. Here he said, don't even bother coming. You don't have to come. Just say the word. Just say the word. He'll be healed. Okay. Look at this. This man knew Jesus had the authority to heal the servant without even going to pray over him. Jesus called that faith. Okay. Now so, look at Matthew next 9, 20. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe for she thought if I could just touch his robe, I would be healed. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. See, this woman back then when, with bleeding issues, you weren't allowed to be in public. But look at this. This woman pushed through the crowds, was persistent, and refused to quit. She was where she wasn't supposed to be. She knew Jesus was her answer. One touch from him would heal her. That's called faith. Okay, so I don't know if you're catching on, but we're going to keep going. Matthew 9, verse 27 to 30. As Jesus left the house, two blind men began following him, shouting out over and over, Son of David, show us mercy and heal us. And they followed him right into the house where Jesus was staying. So Jesus asked them, do you believe that I have the power to restore sight to your eyes? They replied, yes, Lord, we believe. Then Jesus put his hands over their eyes and said, you will have what your faith expects. And instantly their eyes opened and they could see. Then Jesus warned them sternly, make sure that you tell no one what just happened. <laughs> but unable to contain themselves, they went out and spread the news everywhere. Hello. <laughs> they least, were blind. At least Jesus had a sense of humor. They were blind and now they can see. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Nobody would notice. Right? Like, yeah, kind of crazy. But I love the key that's in this. Let's look at this. You will have what your faith expects. There was an expectation that Jesus would heal them. Not maybe or possibly, but would heal them. That's called faith. Let's keep going. Matthew uh, 15, 22. It says a, a Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O son of David. For my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Now verse 28. And verse 28, we jump down to it. It says, Jesus speaks, he says, dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now, if you read through the story, she, wouldn't, she didn't qualify to get a miracle because she was a Gentile, not a Jew. Jesus came for the Jews. Are you hearing me? But she's watching and hearing all the stuff that's going on every time Jesus showed up. She says, I got to tap into that. She didn't qualify. I hope you get this. Some of you think, well, I don't qualify. If you knew what I did, I wouldn't qualify for God to show up. Well, she didn't qualify either. She just, her persistence, come on. Her, her saying, no, I won't be denied. No, I'm not leaving without it. What happened? Because of her pushing through. See, sometimes people say, well, I'll do it if it's easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's quiet in here, church. I'll do it if it doesn't take too much effort. But when you push through, you get breakthroughs. It says your faith is great and your request is granted. She was tormented by demons, and the faith of the mother got her set free. Wow. Yeah. Some of you need to hear that for your kids, for some issues that are going on in your families. Come on. Her faith was great, and her request was granted. 
She was set free. Her daughter was set free. Hebrews is called, the nickname of that is, is called the Hall of Faith. Right? The world may have the Hall of Fame, but let me tell you, the Hall of Faith is a whole lot better. All the powerful miracles throughout the Old Testament are listed here. But every verse, if you read through this, Hebrews 11, it starts, by faith, so-and-so did this. By faith, so-and-so did that. By faith. I hope you guys are catching on to the key here. And it's Hebrews 11, and then we're going to skip to 32 to 34. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all of the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. What is the key? What is the theme? Faith. Faith. You guys are smart. Faith can do impossible things. Impossible things. Demons were cast out by faith. People, bodies were healed by faith. Kingdoms were overthrown by faith. Come on. Justice came through faith. Lion's mouths were shut by faith. There's nothing you can go through that faith cannot be an answer for. Come on. But look at this. Jesus was all powerful, right? But the miracles he performed were based on the faith of those around him. This means that we too can tap into miracles through developing our faith. Too many times we have this mentality, well, God knows what I need. God's all powerful. He can do anything. No, he works with us. And a whole teaching, we'll get into this in the series, but there's an authority he gave to you and I on the earth that we need to cooperate with him. And one of the keys to seeing miracles is actual faith. I look at that woman who had the issue of blood. She... She just touched the hem of his garment. There was crowds pressed all around him. All the other people pressing around him weren't healed, but she was. He probably didn't even see her, but he felt, it says he felt virtue go out of him. Why? Because she had faith. Faith will stand you out in the middle of a crowd. Come on. Faith will stand you out in the middle of a crisis. When the economy is going down and you've got faith, you're going to stand out because it's not, you're not going to live out the same experience as everybody else. You see, faith will stand you out and get God's attention just like it did with her. Just having a need is not enough. We have to have faith and understand what this thing called faith is all about. Matthew 9 verse 2 It says, some people brought a paralytic man on a mat. And it says, Jesus has said, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. And immediately he's healed. Seeing their faith. It didn't say the guy had faith. It said his friends had faith. Oh, some of you didn't get it. You can step in on behalf of a friend and have Jesus do a miracle for them. Did you know that? You have enough relationship DNA in you, connection to the, to the miracle worker that you can step in and ask God to do something on, as a favor for you to help somebody else out. Some of you are getting quiet and thinking, I don't know about this. Well, you read through scriptures many times. The centurion didn't qualify for miracles, but he was so good to the disciples and to the church there. He was a Roman, and but when he, but when he needed a miracle, they stepped in and they said, hey, can you please help out? He's a good man. He's helped us. He didn't qualify, but the disciples qualified him. 
You, you didn't get that. I said, you might be walking through a situation that looks impossible, and all of a sudden, you, somebody you know is in dire straits. You think, my God, I hope they get a miracle. You're the answer to their miracle. You can go to your heavenly Father on their behalf. You don't need to go looking for the church. You got everything you need. Me and 17 people. Okay, I'm, I'm going to work this side That's of the why room. It's gonna be I said, you have everything they need. So what are you going to do? You're going to take your authority as a believer. You're going to go to the Father and say, hey, remember what you did here for so-and-so in the Bible? Remember, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, he just needs you to remind yourself. He doesn't need reminding. He needs you to step in and say, hey, remember this? Remember what you did for so-and-so? You did it for so-and-so. If you did it for them, you can do it for, come on, you can help my friend out in the middle of a crisis. And God will say, man, I'm so glad you asked. See, he's looking for somebody that will put their faith to something. Because we walk around today with a lot of doubters, especially in the churches. I doubt God will do that. Well, I doubt that'll happen, and I doubt that'll happen, and I doubt that'll happen. You're thinking, my God, I thought you called yourself believers. Oh, it's quiet in here. If you're God, with God, all things are possible. Why are you even doubting? I'm just throwing it out there. See, we have to be people that know who our God is, know that he's ready to step in, and he's ready to intervene. He's ready to do supernatural things for us. All we have to do is ask. That's right. You have not because you ask not. Let's start asking. When we ask for other people, that God gets God even more excited because it's not just about you. It's about you helping somebody else. Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. And these miracle signs will accompany pastors. I uh, got some of you there. And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisoned. That does not mean you go out and do it intentionally, okay? We don't play with snakes and yeah, whatever else, right? It means, Bill, when you get in a situation, you're protected. I have a motto, a good snake is a dead one. Yeah. Are you with me? <laughs> That's just me. Me too. And they, who's they? The ones who believe. They will lay hands on the sick and heal them. You guys, we believe that our job is to equip you to go and pray with people, to see people set free. We get a lot of calls. Would you pray for so-and-so? Can you come here? Can you? And that's great. If their faith isn't there yet, yeah, we're going to join with you. But you know what? I want your faith so strong that not only are you seeing God move in your life and heal your body and heal your life and restore things and see you having miracles in your life, but now that you go to others with a boldness that says, you know what? <laughs> I believe. That means I can go and I can see miracles happen all around. That is the way revival is going to happen, guys. God showed me this probably 12 years ago. Um, you know, God, we had all these prophetic words, revival is going to happen in the church, and they kept, all these people kept trying to tell us what it was going to look like. Oh, your doors are never going to close. People are going to be at the altar for all night and all this. And it's like, that could happen. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what God breathes. But he told me that that's not what it's going to look like here. What it's going to look like is they're going to come in one way and they're going to leave differently and they're going to take that power of God to their community. That's when we become an effective church. That's when we become effective, when we start taking what God's done in our life out to people, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, to your family members. Start sharing, hey man, you know what? I know you're going through a hard time, but this is what Jesus did for me. You know, can... I can help you. I can pray with you. Do you want to know what Jesus could do for you? I still remember um, we were on a cruise. We used to do a lot of cruising, like, I don't know, 35 cruises before COVID? Yeah. Anyhow, we were sitting on a cruise, and when we're on vacation, I kind of, I don't like to talk to people on cruise. I talk to people all the time. I just want to read my book, do my thing. He's in the hot tub visiting with 
everybody on the ship. So by the end of any vacation we have, he knows everybody, right? Like, Ralph. Anyhow, so I'm sitting there. I'm reading my book, doing my thing. And I see this older woman sitting on a chair a couple over from me. And she's like, oh, oh. And I'm like, Jesus help her, you know? <laughs> you guys do the same thing, okay? And so I'm sitting there, and, and she's like, she like, goes laying down, she's like, oh, right? And she's barely moving, and this goes on and on. And I'm like, okay, Lord, just healing on her in Jesus' name. And he goes, and she's still, he goes, is that all you're going to do? Go pray with her. And I'm like, I don't want to go pray with her. I'm off duty. I'm off duty. Can't you see the sign? I'm on vacation. Um, anyone ever been there? Am I the only one? Okay. okay, you guys are all just so much better than me, but. So finally I get up and I go over and I sit down. And I'm like, I said, hey, I'm sorry you look like you're in a lot of pain. Um, would you mind if I pray with you? Because I believe God is a healer and that he would like to heal you right now if you would let me pray. And when she, she's like, yes, please, right? And so I pray with her instantly. She's healed. And, um, and I've prayed with people before and it doesn't look like anything. Else. Like we've all been there. But you never know when those moments where he will do it. So she's instantly healed, and she's moving around, but she's not groaning. And she goes, maybe it's just the way I'm sitting. <laughs> so, so she's moving around, laying down. She goes, it's gone. What did you do to me? And so I, should, I said, actually, that's how much God loves you. He wanted me to come over and pray with you because he loves you so much that he wants to be in your life, and he wanted to heal your body. And she, goes, she started crying. She goes, my sons know Jesus, and they keep trying to tell me about him. Come on. You see, you don't know, right? Yeah. But will we be obedient to believe that God could do something and actually go and be the ones to actually do it? Now, I couldn't get her like, hey, would you come to church with me next Sunday? <laughs> it needed to be here and now. Yes. And you're running into people who need the here and now, yeah. who need a touch from God, who need you to be brave enough to say, hey, okay, God, it's not about me, it's about you. Let's see what you can do here. You know, 30 years ago when I... When we went to a church for the first time, first Sunday morning, and I had come out of the environment that miracles are not for today, that whatever you see is the setup, and all of it's really a bunch of mal malarkey. Are you with me? I grew up in that. And I remember being in the service, and it got to the end of the service, and all of a sudden, the pastor says, well, we're going to pray for people with, with arthritis. And I had arthritis in the knee from a snowmobile accident. And I'm thinking, oh, pfft, whatever. My wife says, well, why, why don't you go up? I said, well, because it's all a sham. She says, well, what do you have to lose? And pushes me into the aisle. Are you with me? Literally pushed now, I'm kind into of the exposed aisle. now, so if I look, I'm going to look really dumb if I start fighting with her. So I figure, well, what do I got to lose? I'll go up there, and as he's walking past, I don't feel any surge of power, energy, heat. I don't feel anything. And he makes a comment, God's also healing eyes, and keeps walking. And then that afternoon, my, I realized I was getting headaches from my glasses. Quick, guys, run to the doctor six months later to find out I'm supernaturally healed. Come on, 2020 vision. I'm 30 years ago, I'm 58, I still don't wear glasses. I don't need them at night. I don't need bifocals. It might be the Lord. I got a check. But I didn't have faith for anything. But I got pushed into an environment that had it all. Oh, I hope you get this. Because that's why people walk through this church. They come through the first time, they get healed of cancer. People say, well, how did that happen? I said, well, I don't know, because they're in an environment where miracles operate. That's right. You can be in an environment where miracles are always in operation. It's a choice. It's a choice. Yeah. Will you believe God for stuff that looks impossible? Yeah. Well, what? See, they tell the pastors now, don't pray for the sick because if they don't get healed, it looks really bad for you. I'm serious. Wow. This is the malarkey they're teaching in the Bible schools today. Well, the, the results aren't up to me. 
All God's asked us to do is pray for those that need help. The results are up to him. If it fails, well, I gave it my best shot. Are you with me? God won't hold me accountable for the results. He'll only hold me accountable if I even stepped out to try. What if it doesn't happen? Well, I said, what if it does? Come on, somebody. Well, their faith isn't on. It doesn't really matter. God can show up and we hear it every week. People walk in and they get the first time they show up. They get supernaturally healed. And sometimes we never hear about it for years. In fact, I just had one a few months back, 10 years. You healed my dad. I'm like, who? (laughs) Come on, somebody. It was 10 years ago. He showed up to one service. I didn't do anything. I prayed. Come on, somebody. I don't have that kind of connection, but I do know who does. And if I can connect, come on, hot Connect from this one to this one and God flows through you, then your miracles happen. That's right. It's his power. That's right. It's his power that's at work in us. I said it's his power that's at work in us. Will you even step out and try? Well, I don't know what people are going to think. I said, they think you're crazy anyways. What's the difference? Just a little bit more crazy. Might as well be crazy and have some miracles. That's what I say. (laughs) It's an option, you know. I really believe that we're not seeing the supernatural release because the church has not been released yet to do it. I'm not talking about the pastors. I said the church. You. When you don't think you're entitled to something, you'll never take it. But when you know it's yours, you'll have a confidence. Jesus said, this is the confidence you will have. You know that whatever you ask in my name, it's done. God is looking to do miracles on this earth more than you are looking to see them happen. My question is, will we step out and be obedient? We decided as a church, some people call us a cult. As crazy as that sounds. I said, just don't drink the Kool-Aid. You should be okay. Are you with me? (laughs) Only donuts and coffee. We don't do Kool-Aid. And if we cut those out, somebody would kill us, you know. But but here's the crazy thing. We see more miracles happen because we just believe God. I didn't say we're the most popular. I hope you're hearing this. I'm saying we're just going to believe God. We'll go into the pit of hell and pull people out. Somebody came and said... Sorry about so-and-so. They were a little disruptive, you know, when they were this and that. And I looked at them. I said, why are you apologizing? Thank God they at least came back to church. Come on, somebody. What do you think? Your life's perfect and you never had a problem? I'd rather they show up to church. There's a chance for something supernatural to happen if they're in that environment. I hope you're getting stretched a little bit. Because God's, I want God to start stirring in you that you are the answer to people's problems today. That you hold the keys to their breakthrough. Let's take a look at this, because this is exactly what this says. Not only do we want all of us here operating in miracles for our lives, but we need to be a church that believes enough to go pray for others and see miracles happen. Amen. We need to be a church that's not within these walls. We need to be a church that goes and takes what we get Our job is not to do ministry. Our job is to equip you to do ministry. That's That's what the Bible says. For you to come in and have an experience that changes your life that you go out and share with others. Your story is needed by somebody else who's in the middle of where you used to be. Come on. I can't own your story, but you sure can. But look at this. Lack of faith will stop or hinder miracles. Look at Matthew 13, verse 54 to 58. Now, throughout throughout the story of Jesus, he would talk about going and speaking to the thousands and speaking to the crowds, and it would always say, and everyone was healed, and every disease was healed, and every sickness was healed. Every. That's a big word, right? But then we come into this. Verse 54, he returned to Nazareth, his hometown, 
When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Now, being offended towards God or even mocking miracles can set you up to not experience one yourself. And many times we can be offended with God. Well, you didn't show up when I needed you. I don't believe it. And those are some things that maybe we've got to start dealing with in our hearts of kind of like, you know, I was disappointed when you didn't do this, God. I'm just, those are real things that we need to start talking to God about and going, you know, just heal that place in my heart. Forgive me for being offended with you. But, but we need to start understanding that God wants to do things. And let me tell you, we've been, we've take, as I said, we've taken a lot of hits for being a church where miracles happen. And, but I don't care. I would rather have Jesus come <laughs> than for him to not be able to do anything in our midst. Right? Look at, look at this. Doubt will kill your miracle. Faith is the only thing that can conquer doubt. If you're sitting here kind of going, I don't know if I, like if you're like him, like, F, I don't believe in miracles. Well, you know what will conquer that is building your faith. Because as you build faith, it does conquer the doubt. Because we all are going to deal with things in our minds like, that scream at you. But when you have a deep-rooted faith, your faith clouds out that doubt. And the doubt will try to come up, and your faith just goes, nope, not today. My faith says I can, you know, doubt says, ah, this is too much. God can't do this one. Or you've been dealing with this for too long. Or you deserved it. Or, you know, all of your family have had it. You're going to have it. Nope. Faith says, nope, but my God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah, come on. What he did for them, he'll do for me. That's why we share testimonies, is we want you to realize, if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. The Bible says he's no respecter of persons, but the key is we have to develop our faith. Now look at this. Matthew 13, 58, in the voice translation, it said it this way, Jesus didn't bother to, do, to work wondrous miracles there in Nazareth because the people did not believe. He didn't bother because the people didn't even believe. So do you see the correlation to miracles and believing? Look at this. I never want to be the church where Jesus didn't bother to come do miracles because we didn't believe. Let me say that again. I never want to be the church where Jesus doesn't bother to come do miracles because we didn't believe. I want to be the church that says, we do believe. Yeah. We do believe. My mind can't quite comprehend it, but my faith in my spirit says it can be done. We've got to start learning how to use faith to overcome our experience, to overcome our doubts, to overcome our fears, to overcome... the. The, the training maybe we've had in our lives. But when we start doing that, all of a sudden, we're going to start seeing God show up. We've seen AIDS healed. We've seen cancer healed. We've seen children who have been prodigals for years, like 15 years, never heard from them come back. We've seen financial miracles. We've seen mortgages that just disappear. Dead we've raised. seen the dead raised. We've seen all of it, and I want to see more. I'm not happy. Until every single person walks in here healed and leaves healed, I'm not happy. But that means all of us have to come with a faith that starts believing God that every single week we're going to see God move and that people who are hurting are going to be restored. If we all together raise our faith level, man, Jesus is going to show up. He's going, whoa, I healed every single one of them. That's what I want. I don't want us to be where like, oh, I don't know. If you don't want a miracle, this is not the church for you. <laughs> Just saying. But if you want miracles, this is the place. Welcome home. Welcome home. 
because God's going to start doing miracles. Like he's always so faithful. You know, if we want to have a supernatural life, we must learn how to grow our faith and never stop growing. In Hebrews 11, 6, we're going to end with this verse. And it says, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith knowing that he is real and that he has rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Let me say it this way. Faith is the only currency accepted in heaven to release miracles on earth. Let me say that one more time. Faith is the only currency accepted in heaven to release miracles on earth. You know, I believe that as we're walking through this series and we learn how to tap in, how to get our faith turned on, how to start believing, we'll see supernatural things at even greater measures than we've seen now. You'll pinch yourself in a month and say, I can't believe what's been going on in my life. I can't believe what's, that I'm seeing God show up. See, God is looking, roaming around the earth, looking to show himself mighty. That's what the Bible says. He is looking for an opportunity to get involved in my life and in your life. He's not on the side thinking, well, if I'm not too busy, I'll help out. No, he's eagerly looking for an opportunity to get involved in our lives. And when we get a revelation of that, you'll be well, then <laughs> I'm right over here. I mean, there's no point passing me. I'm right here, God. What are you telling God? I'm ready to see you do something supernatural. I need help. I've been trying to do things on my own. I haven't got the results I want. Well, God in the picture, all things are possible. Why fight? Why, why, why make it a difficult life? I'm going to take a minute here right now. Make sure your life is right with the Lord. Make sure that if something happened to you today, you would know heaven's home for me. If you pray this prayer, maybe you're here, maybe you're Winnipeg campus, maybe you're online. If you've never prayed this prayer, if you pray, God will start... Um, he'll start your mansion, construction on your mansion today, immediately. He wants you in his family. He's eagerly seeking for you to come and be part of his family. The only way to do it is to ask him to come into your life. There's no 300 questions and hoops to jump through. It's basically ask me to come into your life and I'll change your life. And we're going to pray a prayer here in a minute. I'm going to ask everybody to say it out loud with me. If you're online, wherever you are, say it out loud. In the Winnipeg campus, say it out loud. As we pray it, watch what God will do in your life. The prayer goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And help me to live for you. And help me to live for you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 